Hi, good morning everyone. This is Nicole Testa Boston, um, the Deputy Director here at FIA Tech, and we're very glad you could join us uh, this Tuesday morning for a discussion by Dr. Um, Dr. and Professor Lucio Soibelman. Uh, he received the um, our Distinguished uh, Researcher, Outstanding Researcher Award at the SETI Gala this past April in Miami, and uh, we've invited him to come and share with us uh, some of the research that he's doing um, now at the University of Southern California. Before I go ahead and um, introduce him, though, I wanted to take a moment and explain to folks how the GoToMeeting system works. Uh, you have a toolbar on your screen that's unique to you, so you can move that around or minimize it using that orange arrow uh, to get it off your screen if you'd like. Uh, you also will have noticed that you're on a defaulted mute setting. Uh, that is uh, due to the large number of attendees. Um, however, we do encourage participation and comments and questions, and you can do that at any time by using the questions tab on that toolbar. Uh, you can type in your questions there or, or points that you'd like further clarification on. Those will go directly to me, and as time permits throughout the presentation, I will uh, moderate those with um, Professor uh, Soibelman. So um, please do... Um, and feel free to use that tool to uh, send those in. And if we do run out of time, we will follow up with you uh, following the webinar. And last but not least, we are recording this webinar. We will be making a copy of it available on the FIA Tech website in the next few days. Uh, it will include both the PowerPoint uh, slides and the audio. So with that, I want to go ahead and introduce Professor Soibelman. He obtained his bachelor and master's degrees from the Civil Engineering Department of the Universidad Federal de Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. He worked as a construction manager for 10 years before moving in 1993 to the U.S., where he obtained in, in 98 his doctorate in civil engineering systems from the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at MIT. Uh, in 1998, he started as an assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. In 2004, he moved as an associate professor to the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Carnegie Mellon. And in 2004, he was promoted to professor. In January 2012, just, just recently, he joined the University of Southern California as the chair of the Sunny Astani Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. During the last 15 years, his, he has focused his research on advanced data acquisition, management, visualization, and mining for construction and operations of advanced infrastructure systems. He published over 100 books, um, chapters, journal papers, conference articles, and reports, and performed research with funding from the NSF, um, NASA, DOE, Army, NIST, IBM, Bosch, I, um, IDOT, and Red Zone Robotics, among other funding agencies. He's the current chief editor of the ASCE Computing and Civil Engineering Journal. And his areas of interest are use of information technology for economic development, information technology support for construction management, process integration during the development of large-scale engineering systems, information logistics, artificial intelligence, data mining, knowledge discovery, image reasoning, text mining, machine learning, advanced infrastructure systems, sensors, streaming data, and multi-reasoning mechanisms. I'm just going to say all the cool stuff. So <laughs> um, we're uh, really thrilled, um, Lucio, to have you here and share uh, your work with us. So um, let's go ahead and get started. OK. OK, thank you, Nicole. Uh, I, um, uh, when I decided uh, how to organize this talk, I think that uh, it's going to be an overview of uh, my whole research for many years. Uh, with several different collaborators. Uh, you are going to see during the talk uh, all those collaborators that I've been working with. And the idea is, uh, was related to the award because the award was for my uh, whole research, wasn't for one specific research, so I decided to present everything that I've been doing. Uh, one disclosure is that, uh, as Nicole was saying, I just moved it to USC, so a large, uh, almost all this body of research was done uh, while I was uh, at uh, Illinois and later when I was at CMU, but I'm going to be, when I present the research, I'm going to more or less say who I did this research and what was uh, 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 and where I did it. So, uh, so uh, uh, okay, so my beginning of my career, as Nicole was saying, was at the University of Illinois. And uh, one example, what I was really doing was, uh, uh, 
I already had interest in this uh, big data problem that uh, now NSF is talking a lot, but the idea that uh, I had the feeling that you are starving for knowledge and uh, at the same time you are drowning on all the data. Uh, we started to get very cheap hard drives, uh, uh, Excel and uh, databases uh, that people had in every computer started to be filled with information, with data, not say information, and uh, we uh, were not really analyzing those things. So uh, with my background in construction management and my PhD more in the, in the computer science side at MIT, I, uh, when I got my job in Illinois, I started trying to bridge those two areas. And uh, my main curiosity was really that uh, 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 my experience in construction was uh, senior project managers, they knew everything and I knew nothing as a younger a project manager. They, uh, everything was coming from experience. When you would come up with an estimate, they would come. Uh, I would look to a, 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 a book and would get productivity rates, and those numbers would hard numbers. And my boss would look at me and say, "Okay, multiply this by 0 0.8 because it's going to be the winter. It's going to be raining. Uh, uh, we have some labor problems, and uh, let's consider 80 percent of our normal." Uh, 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 labor rate and uh, uh, he was always right and this always impressed me I was always wrong so how he did build his knowledge and experience was something that I was very curious and I always wanted to know can we learn from data and so uh, uh, so basically uh, what I was looking at the explosive growth and capability of generate and collect data but at the same time you are not using that data so then I started uh, this work with uh, with uh, uh, one of my first PhD students at the time was uh, now Dr. Hyung Joo Kim and uh, he is a professor in uh, College State Long Beach. So uh, I was lucky enough that being in Illinois, the U.S. Army uh, Corps of Engineers has a, a local lab in Champaign, Illinois, that it's the CERN lab, and they uh, uh, provided me data. They had a, a project at the time in, in, uh, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, that they were building uh, uh, levy walls. Uh, wall after wall after wall, ma miles of wall, okay? And they were divided, the construction in four phases. And uh, they, uh, they uh, were always behind schedule. All the three phases, they ended up delivering really, really behind schedule. And it wasn't really a complex project. It's a wall and uh, excavation behind the wall where they're installing a drainage pipeline uh, uh, behind the wall. That's all that they had to do, very repetitive, and they still were behind and behind schedule. And uh, uh, I got the whole data. They had a large database called RMS and uh, asked the project managers why they thought that they were behind schedule. And as expected, uh, they now, uh, project managers have a tendency of not uh, consider anything that it's their own guilt or own problem. They, uh, they would not say, I didn't buy materials, I messed up, always is weather. And uh, because it's God, it's responsible for weather, it's not me. So they always would say, oh, weather, weather, it's raining, you have cave-ins, you have all those problems. And it's, uh, uh, it's fun because in five minutes I went to to the internet and I look at that those uh, uh, years from uh, uh, 95 to 99 were very dry years. They were much drier and much less rain than average years. So uh, this had to be taken into consideration when they were planning. So yeah, what we tried, we tried the first time that we tried playing with the machine learning and data mining tools, trying to find uh, uh, cause and effect relationship on data. And, uh, and basically what we found out just by looking at their own data uh, uh, was that, uh, yeah, weather wasn't the, the main problem. Their main problem was that they had uh, large boulders. And uh, every time that they would hit one of those boulders in the excavation, they had to bring new equipment. So the second reason for delay was lack of equipment, that they had to wait for the equipment to come and for them to be able to uh, break down the, the, the boulder and remove the boulder. So, so uh, this was in their own data. When we went back to them, they said, oh yeah, sure, those boulders are a nightmare. But just by uh, stepping back and looking at the data, we were able to see something that the project managers in their daily firefighting operations were not able to realize what was the real problem. And what you recommended them was 
than a, a, a ground penetrating radar for them to map those boulders and have this equipment uh, running five to the five miles or three miles ahead of the construction crew, finding the boulders, removing the boulders, and making sure, having time to plan, bring the equipment, remove the boulders, making sure that when the construction uh, a crew would arrive at that stage in the construction, would not have those uh, uh, problems anymore. With that, we are really able to save a lot of money. The interesting thing is that uh, 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 we were able to calculate the savings and all this. But what we learned from all those processes is that data in construction is extremely dirty. All the fields had problems in the database. All the uh, people are not really using those databases, so they are acquiring in a very strange way, and they are not really uh, 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 caring about what data they are acquiring. So we had a lot of missing fields. We had a lot of uh, wrong inputs. So uh, then came later in my research all the need and several researchers today are working in really automating this process of data acquisition using better devices, on-site devices, handhelds, uh, uh, radio frequency tags, sensors, uh, uh, laser scanners, this was a, a, a really needed, was the basic conclusion that I arrived because it took us six months just to be able to clean, prepare the data to be able to do the analysis and uh, this is too much time and we really need an expert. So this first research ended up uh, developing a framework for data preparation, data cleaning and feature selection for uh, construction operations. Then uh, when I got known as, as a, a, a uh, someone that liked the data, data started to uh, uh, come to me. Okay, People would connect me, call me and say, okay, I have all this data and I'm drowning on data. So the next thing that happened was uh, at the time I had a PhD student, Carlos Calder, still in Illinois. Uh, he's now a professor in Texas, Austin. And, uh, and the idea, yeah, there is the well-known idea that all of you probably know that's the BIM, the integration, interoperability, integrating all the design uh, uh, elements. In this case was an extranet company, uh, uh, Bricksnet at the time, many years ago, that they, uh, they uh, had uh, uh, one extranet where they were keeping all the text documents, change orders, requests for information, specifications, all those text documents in a folder-based system in the internet. Uh, while all pro, uh, project participants could uh, uh, retrieve and download or upload those files. The problem is that the searching from those files were very, very difficult. People could not uh, really find the files when they needed. And they came to us and said, would be you're now talking about BIM, if you, you double click now in our know, object, you know, wall object, you can retrieve from the estimate the amount of, of bricks and the hours of labor you can extract from the uh, uh, schedule when this wall is going to be built. It would be wonderful for us in a beam to be able to double click in a wall and retrieve every text document that was ever created about that wall. Since the specification paragraph that talks about that wall to the change order, to the request for information, to the email from the client saying don't paint this wall yellow, paint it white. So all the information integrated to, the, to those objects. So this was a challenge uh, and uh, you really start looking into the domain area of tax mining and information retrieval to be able to do it. So basically the problem was you have to get all the one million tax documents generated in a project, classify them, and then find out a way to retrieve and rank those documents uh, and how you associate those documents to each object in the project. Uh, the problem is that uh, if you think, for example, if you could use Google, uh, a Google engine behind your text documents to be able to uh, retrieve those documents. Uh, when you think about Google, how Google uh, uh, ranks documents for retrieval, Google basically uses the number of links, okay, how many links to that page. So uh, if you look for uh, USC, there are millions of links to the USC page and to my page there is a very small number of links. So if you're searching for USC, uh, first page that's going to show up, it's the, ori the home page from the universe, not my page that tells that I'm a professor at USC because there is a gap, uh, there is a large number of of links to the original page from USC page. And the same thing, they use number of hits too. How many people are 
selecting that page as uh, seeing reading that page compared to the number of hits that are in my page. So this they have a, a measure of relevance, and then it's why you do USC search. The first thing that shows up it's the university page, not my page. How you do this with construction documents? Construction documents don't have, we don't have links, we don't have hits. Uh, sometimes you have a very important document that has zero hits, and you really want the document. So you really needed to find a different way, different than 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 uh, 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 Google to be able to retrieve those documents. So Carlos' solution was basically to cre create a vector representation from information retrieval uh, domain. And basically, when you think you think that the documents are, uh, you create this matrix with every document, it's a column, and every row, it's a word. Okay. So if you are looking for for the document bar, okay, uh, uh, you have a document that has the word door, lock, uh, uh, frame, and you have all those types of uh, words in the in that document. Uh, so two things basically are important when you're doing those types of retrievals. One we call a, a, a polysemy, okay, and the other is called synonym. Synonym it's, it was a problem in a project that you had a, 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 an architect in England talking about the lift and the project manager in the U.S. talking about the elevator. If you do a search with lift and if it's looking for the word lift, you just bring 50% of the documents and all the documents that are talking about the elevator you don't bring. Uh, unless you have an ontology behind with a mapping schema of uh, words that are synonyms. Police emits words that are used uh, in uh, uh, different, uh, same word, different contexts. Uh, so you have word door used in every document, door for circuit breaker panels, door for, for kitchen cabinets, door, uh, door, a real door element that you're looking in a project. So how you separate those things? So what happened with this vector representation, Carlos was able to, to uh, uh, if you see, if you think that the document is a vector in a way that each column, it's all the terms and you have all the dimensions as terms. So uh, when you're looking for the document lift, okay, you retrieve every document that it's talking about elevator because even if you don't have the same query word lift and elevator, you have many other dimensions in this vector that are similar like uh, uh, shaft, cables, stops, and all those make those two vectors be very, uh, very, uh, end up being near each other. So uh, you can use this distance measurement of vectors to use as a ranking and retrieve the documents. So we, Carlos build the prototype that starts with an IFC file. You go and you select an object. From this object, you extract from IFC text representation, so you, you create a query vector and then you go and you retrieve every document that talk about, in this case, this light fixture, and uh, you have the numbers basically in parentheses next to each document is uh, uh, the distance from the query vector to the vector that represents the document. So you really can end up uh, ranking the documents. It's pretty interesting understanding, and it's the same concept that I was talking about, dealing with large amount of data. It's basically uh, looking for patterns in the case of the construction, organizing this huge amount of text documents in this case. Uh, we did a validation with 20 project databases provided by BricsNet and uh, we got very good uh, recall and precision. Uh, we got uh, uh, 67, almost 70 percent recall at the same time that precision wasn't so important because our number of documents, it's not like the one million, doc, uh, 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 a billion documents in the internet. It's a much smaller set of documents, so we could bring some documents that are not relevant that you could save to, but important for us was to bring every document to have a very high recall, not miss any important document, and you are able to improve comparing those IR systems are basically Google and uh, other search engines and some uh, software uh, that uh, companies that have their own uh, uh, project management uh, uh, document system that you compare to their internal search engines. So what happened? Then another company came uh, uh, to talking to me and disclosed, "Hey, I, uh, I, uh, uh, we have too too, uh, too many pictures. Uh, we have now digital cameras in every telephone, and people are taking pictures from uh, from construction sites. And the name of the pictures are." Uh, uh, 
uh, uh, mvv123.jpg, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, after we have a problem in a column, in a concrete column here, there is a crack. I want to see every picture that I have about that column. Uh, in my database, I have to open it picture by picture. Okay? Uh, it's very difficult to classify pictures. Uh, again, it would be wonderful if I could go to the BIM model and double click in the column and retrieve every picture that shows that column. So this was, uh, again, still in Illinois, working with uh, my PhD student, Yonis Brilakis, that is now a professor at Georgia Tech. So, uh, so uh, what we did then was basically uh, 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 the idea of uh, understanding that a picture, in this case, had too many objects on it. The name of this picture here in this figure, uh, in this slide, is uh, uh, domesticwatermains.jpg. Okay? It's just uh, uh, trying, the reason was this, why this picture was taken was that copper uh, water line. Okay? And uh, you have all those other columns and beams and, and uh, every material that you have uh, uh, showing here in this lab, uh, concrete slab in the left. So all these are part of the picture and you would not be able to give a name to the picture that uh, classify all the objects that appear in the picture in a manual way having the name of the uh, complete label for the pictures calling still column 13, still column 22, giving all those names. Uh, uh, we measure with several uh, students counting objects and pictures and you saw a range from zero to 300 objects in a picture. Zero, I don't, never understood why a picture of a sky, but, uh, but uh, we could have an average in mean around 45 to 50 objects per picture. No one would give 50 names to a picture. So here was really, again, trying to use uh, computer science and some of those tools to help us. We try again to find a, a representation for the pictures like we did with segments in the text. In this case, we, we try to look pixel by pixel and use all the filters that are available in uh, image reasoning to create a signature for the pixels. And then we uh, we start realizing, uh, understanding that this pixel is a concrete, it's an insulation, it's, it's steel. At the same time, we added uh, information about the position that the camera was taking, so the objects that are behind the camera cannot be shown in that picture. You use the date that the picture was taken and using the schedule, if the object it's not built can, cannot be shown in the picture. So you use it several other uh, 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 approaches approach to reduce our search space. It's always the idea of reducing the search space and focusing on a smaller amount of data. And the same thing here, uh, we went from IFC, you select an object, in this case you will go to find images and you retrieve uh, every image that uh, uh, showed that specific wall from, in this case, all from the outside. Then what happened in my career, uh, 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 there was an interesting opportunity for me beyond construction, but looking at the whole life cycle, I had a lot of interest uh, in this area. At Carnegie Mellon was, uh, uh, Jim Garrett was spearheading and starting a, a, a new group called Advanced Infrastructure Systems in, at CMU, that it's looking at uh, uh, the whole life cycle, not just construction, which Joachimji was working heavily in uh, improving construction processes with laser scanners, with being very interesting research, and uh, Jim Garrett working a lot with handhelds and sensors, and uh, the idea was uh, if this would move my, uh, ended up moving my research to another level because the problems generated by these new devices, sensors, and, and uh, and uh, uh, automatic data acquisitions was uh, streaming data in an amount much, much bigger than you ever were able to deal before. Uh, the, just to understand the concept behind the AIS, a very simple example that Jim uses for, for the AIS vision is, a, is a, if you think about yourself uh, as an intelligent being and with sensors in your body, okay, this is the, the the way to, to, to explain, you have a, a, if you have a pain in your knee, you don't go and play football. Uh, uh, you make a lot of decisions. Why? You have a sensor that feels pain in your knee, in your body, but that thing, it's not just the pain. 
it is uh, uh, beyond the pain, uh, it goes to your brain, your brain analyzes that there is a, a decision support system that it's an analysis of that pain. You have uh, 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 your brain making a decision, oh this is a small pain, I still can go and play half time, oh no this is a pain that it's, 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 I should be more careful, I should get some ice and stay home and rest, no this is a pain that it's, it's bad, I, ha I should run to the hospital, to the emergency room now. So all this, it's much beyond of just having a sensor and giving an alarm, okay, there's a lot of interpretation. Same thing if you think about a bridge today, if a bridge has a problem, it collapses and kills people. And a, a good idea would be to have a bridge that uh, uh, f feels pain and tell there is something wrong with me, please come fix me, okay? But again, to understand the idea of false alarms, when the bridge should be calling, uh, when it's an emergency, when the bridge should be asking to be closed, not to let cars on it, or when the, where the bridge could, should send an email saying, hey, wherever you have time, come here and take a look at that. So there are different levels of concerns, and the same thing with the pain and the brain decision that we do with our knee pain. Uh, and this, there is a lot of uh, multidisciplinary uh, uh, needs to be able to deal with this. So there is the electrical engineer that understands about the sensors, but has no clue how many sensors and what, what to sense and how to interpret the results of the sensors. At the same time, there is the civil engineer that understands uh, a lot about the bridge, uh, about the pain points in the bridge and interpretation, but doesn't understand about the, the, the how to acquire this data. Same time you have the computer scientists that know how to build the decision support systems, but they don't understand civil, neither electrical engineers. So the idea behind AIS was really creating a new kind of professional that would stay in between all those professionals and would uh, uh, be capable of uh, communicating and expecting, expressing uh, 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 the requirements from one to the next and being able to build those very complex systems together. So, uh, yes? Um, yes? Before you move on to this next um, subject, um, someone wants to know if you can offer advice on data taxonomy and ontology applying any available industry standards such as OmniClass or others versus creating custom classifications. Well, oh. That is the holy grail, okay, that's a... <laughs> that was that, a good question, I guess. <laughs> that's a good question, okay, and there are very good researchers uh, that we've been talking about these uh, 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 in Canada, okay, Tamer Aldirabi in uh, uh, Nora at University of Illinois today. Uh, 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 this, this is a tough issue. It's a chicken and egg problem. Ideally, yeah, would be to use a taxonomy that it's the same for everyone that would allow the interoperability and everyone would be able to uh, connect the information uh, 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 in a transparent way. The problem is that uh, you are waiting for such a long time and uh, so, so many years people are talking and this is uh, uh, is not happening the way that you expected and neither in the speed that you expect. So there are a lot of people that are moving forward with some of their solutions and uh, uh, I would say that uh, I would not recommend at company level to be doing this, but at association level, people that are working uh, with the steel structures, uh, people that are working with subdomains within the, the construction domain should be pushing forward for their own domains, okay? Oh, okay, thank you. So uh, uh, so then what uh, well, examples of research that you ended up, uh, very related to the research that I did with Yon is in image reasoning. I, uh, uh, while I was uh, in evolution in this area, I joined Jim Garrett uh, in Illinois as a collaborator and we had a student called Wei Gu, she now works through IBM research. So uh, basically uh, this was a company called Red Zone Robotics that had uh, uh, solar robots. They sent down on sowers and uh, 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 you see the robot in the top left. Uh, this is called the responder and uh, they have uh, in the 
top right you have the control room inside a trailer that it's controlling uh, this robot. You see that there's a joystick and, uh, and uh, uh, the operator just drives this robot inside the solar pipe. Uh, this is a dream job for, for my son's generation, working all day with a joystick. But uh, uh, basically their objective is to create a GIS map in the city in the, top, in the bottom right and uh, with those uh, uh, circles, okay, showing where the problems are in the network. The size would be the intensity, uh, how bad the problem is, okay, rank it from one to five, the traditional uh, way to rank uh, solar problems, and uh, allowing, you know, very similar to the beams, uh, beam integration solution, but in this case a GIS, allowing operators of these uh, uh, solar networks to double click in their, uh, 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 double click in the problem in this small circle and see an image, a video, and being able to see where the problem is, what type of problem is. So uh, basically it's, they are doing a lot of this all over the United States. Uh, uh, cities are under what you call consent agreement with EPA that they are being forced to do this. If not, uh, they end up paying huge, huge fines. So what happened, Red Zone, it's the, in this work for a while, a very successful company. But now they developed a new robot called the Solo, that it's an autonomous robot that they send. Uh, it's 10 times cheaper than the responder robot. Uh, this one is uh, uh, without operator. It's, it goes from manhole to manhole and comes back. And uh, basically, a city would be able to buy 30 of those small robots, dump them in a manhole. Uh, it would go inspect from manhole to manhole, would come back. In the end of the day, they would get those 30 uh, 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 robots they would have in their hard drives two hours worth of video, so you are talking about 60 hours of video, and how do you do now? You have 60 hours of video, and you have now uh, the same operator that was inside the trailer with a joystick, now in the office, watching those 60 hours of video, and uh, uh, geocoding it, classifying it, and uh, and uh, this is uh, basically not feasible. So with this new robot, they had to create an uh, automatic detection and classification of the facts. So they, uh, they came uh, talking to us. We got uh, educated in the whole process. There is a, 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 a standard way of classifying the facts on pipes that it's called PACP. Uh, and it, it's pretty complex because it's an hierarchical approach of classifying defect. So you see a structural defect can be a crack that can be a, a, a spiral crack. So uh, and their defects are very similar. Co uh, uh, compound to the problem that you have, as you can imagine, something dark and dirty inside the sewer. Okay, so it's dark, it's dirty, it's, it's hidden, you have water, you have so many problems that uh, make detection very, very, uh, classification very, very difficult. So. So uh, what we start looking is that uh, uh, trying to do classification was a very, very difficult task. So after watching many hours of video with Jim and Wei, we, we realized that we had long segments of pipes without defect. Okay? And then you had a defect and long segment of a healthy pipe. So uh, we went back to Wei and asked her to measure the percentage of uh, defective pipe with healthy pipe and we came up that even in the worst series uh, that the worst database that you had the worst case was 80 percent of healthy pipes to 20 percent of the facts so our idea is that if you don't try at least at this stage classification but if you try uh, 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 a detection algorithm if you can detect and just separate the healthy pipes from the from the defective pipes, you would be able, if you have 100 hours of video, you would be able to separate 80 hours and say, these 80 hours, I'm sure that there is no defect here. You don't have to watch it. You just go and, as a human classifier, you will classify the 20 hours. It means you are saving 80% of the time of this human classifier. So this was the first step that you worked in. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to have time. Uh, I have several other interesting things to show. But you basically use the SIFT-based approach that uh, first uh, it generate these local features descriptors. And then the second step, it, uh, 
it does a feature matching because one interesting thing that happened because this is a video and this is a robot and the robot it's moving the same defect appears uh, in several frames because it's farther now it's near now it's very near so you have to match not classify not to detect the same defect many times and uh, choose one of the best images that represent that defect and then uh, and then you look for matching points. It's basically a subtraction approach that you can find these images different. And then image, when you have different images, you can find the defects. So uh, uh, was uh, uh, at that level was pretty successful. Red Zone was very happy with the fact that uh, we are able, even if not completely successful in classifying everything at that time, you are able to uh, uh, to uh, Demean, uh, to cut their workload in 80 percent and uh, uh, popular science uh, had a, a, a magazine uh, a special issue talking about rebuilding America and presented 25 new technologies transform the crumbling infrastructure and then uh, they really talk about drop robots the drain talking about this research that you're doing with uh, with a uh, red zone uh, you are still uh, looking for funding to go to the next phase to start classifying uh, uh, those defects. Again, would be first classify cracks, that it's the most common type of defect, and then uh, always reducing the idea that I talked before, it's recurrent, it's always the idea of reducing the search space. Then this is a pretty interesting research. This was uh, uh, done with uh, Shung Yang, she, a PhD student at the time, and uh, uh, Jim Garrett again, and with Scott Matthews. This was a, a research in a, in a, uh, related to a Department of Energy. Okay, they they uh, basically were hired by one of their labs called NETL, National Energy Technology Lab in West Virginia. Uh, they are really concerned was when you have an extreme event, when you have a hurricane, when you have a, Katrina, for example, and uh, you disconnect uh, 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 a bridge, a bridge collapses, or, or a port is closed, they wanted to know what would be the impact in uh, uh, energy production in the U.S. because you would not be able to transport coal, the coal would not be able to go to the power plant, and so there is a idea of systems of systems that our infrastructure is all uh, interconnected. If you we have a a disruption in one side in the transportation network, what's the impact in the in energy uh, uh, production in this case and could be distribution to in another case. So uh, they had an emergency to a team at NETL that when we would have a hurricane, they would uh, be, uh, be called in emergency and they would be on call for tw 24 hours a day before the hurricane. And uh, they would receive from the Miami Hurricane uh, uh, Center. They would receive a prediction path from the from the the, the the hurricane, and they would try to give the Department of Energy what was the risk uh, and which power plants would be affected. Uh, in their uh, inventories uh, would be low, and uh, what would be the consequence. So. Uh, uh, basically, the problem that they had is that this database it's really distributed. The database is distributed uh, uh, from uh, several sources. You have uh, 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 coal uh, database, you have power plants databases, you have uh, uh, railroad databases, you have uh, uh, railroad managers, companies database, you have transportation uh, companies databases, you have mines the row of mines database. So you had, they had to work with several of those databases. And for them to do the analysis was uh, taking 20, 15 hours to be able to give an answer about what would be the impact. The problem is that Miami the Hurricane Center would uh, update their hurricane path every two, three hours. So uh, they would have to go back and they would start before they even would present an answer. They would be uh, uh, starting over to to calculate uh, uh, the new path of the hurricane. So it was an in infinite loop that they would never be able to give an answer. So what they really wanted is to create what you call a geospatial uh, data warehouse, where you have all those data sources. You create the data warehouse, you create the data cubes, and you link to a geospatial database. So uh, uh, 
So the idea is uh, uh, something that was developed in this way is that uh, you double click in a bridge in the US, uh, you, uh, uh, you tell the system this bridge is off the grid, okay? It collapses, uh, this grid, uh, this bridge is not operational anymore. And then start popping up in those red dots uh, the power plants affected red dots that they would not have nine, more than 95 percent of their their coal, uh, the yellow uh, from 60 to 95. So you'd see the level of uh, impact in the coals. The the squares are the mines that uh, that uh, uh, that would be affected with their cell uh, uh, transporting their product out if that specific uh, link rail link would be lost. Pretty interesting that uh, this is a really uh, powerful tool when you really can do analysis ranking all the rail segments in the United States by criticality and finding what are the critical segments that if they are uh, affected would impact a larger population in the United States, a large number of power plants. So with this they can find out where they need redundancy in the network and uh, a lot of analysis where uh, they were able to do with that. So. Uh, Another geospatial data uh, analysis uh, was this done with Professor uh, Garrett again with a PhD student Daniel Oliveira, uh, and uh, the idea is again uh, a water authority in a small town near Pittsburgh provided as uh, their historical uh, 10, 15 years of history of uh, water breaks. In the past, they had very good data. There's no geospatial was. Uh, was a normal database, but they had the whole breaks where it happened. Uh, uh, they didn't know why it happened, but they had all the breaks and uh, who was when they fixed it and what they did when they fixed it. The interesting thing is that we created a, a, a geospatial representation of those breaks, and uh, and when you look, it's clearly to see those red dots that are breaks uh, that uh, breaks would happen. What looking for us. Uh, on the clusters, they uh, they happen together. Uh, the beauty of that is uh, we didn't know if it's, it's really a cluster uh, because uh, uh, you have uh, the network is clustered too. So the breaks ha we cannot have breaks in a pipe if you don't have a pipe. The break has to be on top of a pipe, and you have uh, areas that are rural areas. In the network that you have many uh, much smaller number of pipes and areas that you have more dense uh, uh, network of pipes. So obviously that those denser areas you are going to have more breaks. So the idea is uh, when you start looking at the clustering tool, there was no clustering tools that would deal with a network-based uh, 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 geospatial data. But there was a lot of uh, uh, clustering tools for geospatial data, but much more in a radial aspect where you have how a disease is spreads uh, spread from a point uh, they are trying to look uh, into contamination population uh, they are looking at violence uh, they, they have so you have a central point in the neighborhood and they look in radius uh, circles around this neighborhood how this is affected uh, but with us uh, we really uh, you can have two points in the network that are next to each other but they are not the same uh, element in the network. So you really had to look at network distance that was something more interesting. So our idea was to find cluster and trying to find uh, if to have a cluster, why is the reason for this cluster? Okay, uh, The hypothesis is very common that people use for replacement of pipes. It's the age of the pipe. In this case, uh, uh, you wanted to look if it's age and other things. So you are able to to start uh, superimposing other geospatial data like uh, the transportation network for bus traffic, trying to find, and you really found uh, a cluster that was in one of the most traveled networks in bus, so could be uh, an hypothesis. So uh, uh, type of soil, uh, geotechnical uh, geospatial data, start looking if there was some correlation of soil with breaks, buses with breaks, and all the type of things. Uh, so it's pretty interesting. But first to be able to do this, I think that the biggest contribution in this work that Daniel did was really creating the, the network-based uh, uh, geospatial clustering tool. Uh, 
So, uh, so we were able to find that there are clusters that you have same type of pipe, same age, with very different behavior. Okay, so there is something else that explains why those pipes. So they were all installed in the same 1960s. They are all the same type of pipe, but in two areas with much higher density in one point than another point. Uh, so there are some interesting things that you can start doing with that. If you really know the density of breaks within the network, uh, other thing that it's important for them is first to find the, the try to find the hypotheses that are causing those breaks to go and remove it. Okay, and second, it's even when they are doing replacement, the finding if they should replace uh, a meter to meter, ten meters. Uh, what's the probability of breaks? Uh, we think that uh, network and that density and that slice. So sometimes if the probability is too small, we just go and we do a patch fix. If the probability is too big, we can go and replace a, a larger segment. You can do a, 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 a cost-benefit analysis and you ended up writing a paper about this. So uh, again, I don't have time. It's talking a lot about those things that I, I descri described. It. Uh, this is an ongoing research still at CMU with uh, UG Inc., but several prof uh, students, Harley, uh, Danoni, and several professors. Uh, I just have five minutes. Uh, uh, I won't have time, so uh, uh, because I have to leave, Nicole asked me to leave the last ten minutes for questioning. Uh, so, uh, uh, but this is basically again. Uh, uh, health monitoring of pipes and sensing uh, using uh, ultrasonics to send a, uh, a vibration. Think about you get a hammer in a pipe, uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, vibrates through the pipe and uh, uh, you think that the sensors, these PZT sensors, they work like, uh, like the same thing, a uh, uh, mechanical system that uh, from electrical charge you transform the mechanical charge, it vibrates the pipe and uh, sends a uh, ultrasound wave through the pipe and the way that this wave propagates through the pipe and the other sensor sees it in between two sensors you can probably detect a change in between those points so this is exactly what you're trying to do here it's the commercial systems today they're very expensive they are cannot stay installed in pipe so they are basically used for inspection they are installed around the pipe and then they remove it and they are uh, use it in another, uh, <coughs> they, are, they keep moving, so they can interrogate 100 feet of pipe, they move 100, they have two 100 feet apart and they move another 100 feet, they keep moving it because it's a very expensive uh, device, what you are looking at very low cost solutions that we can leave installing the pipe and uh, continuously monitoring changes on that pipe. Uh, the main problem is that the waves propagate very strangely through pipes, there are many modes of, of, uh, of it uh, propagates in the pipe. We, you have a longitudinal mode that goes straight from the two sensors that are aligned, but you have a liquidal ways that this wave propagates. So uh, you end up being very difficult to separate all this noise when you're moving the pipe. So you use it uh, with uh, support from a colleague in electrical engineering that has been working a lot with something called time reversal. Uh, for his radar uh, software that he developed a lot of things for radar uh, operations and uh, you apply the same thing, uh, we send a wave uh, uh, and you send the wave back in a time reverse in a kind of an echo and, uh, and uh, <coughs> we superimpose the, the echo with the original wave after inverting it and, uh, and if you subtract there is just this plain line that it's what you call the noise, that's the difference from the two, so if it's in this way everything, uh, it's okay in the pipe, but as soon as you start having a, 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 a cut or, or a defect in the pipe, you are going to see a focused response showing that something changed and you see the central line, you see that uh, high peak. Uh, the interesting thing with that is that it changed demonstrates change, okay, uh, and this is all the work from Yves Oppenheim uh, and, uh, uh, and Jose Mora uh, and Jim Garrett, uh, so uh, the, the interesting thing that I'm working a lot with one of the students, UG, is that the change is, uh, is uh, <coughs> the change is uh, 
it grabs everything as change. So if you have change in pressure or change in temperature in a fluid inside the pipe, if you have it's on the water pipe, uh, uh, all these uh, time reversals detect as a change. It doesn't need to be a crack or a cut in the pipe. So what I'm working again with using machine learning AI tools with UG trying to classify this peak and trying to see, okay, this peak that we are seeing now is just changing temperature, so nothing wrong with the pipe, that's a false alarm, or no, this is really a crack or something. So I'm, uh, I'm looking at different types of changes that uh, the time reversal is detecting all the changes, and I'm trying to classify those changes in the change that you really want to track. Uh, so, and this uh, last example, this is related to sustainability. This is a work done with uh, uh, when Mario was a PhD student. Now Mario is a professor at Carnegie Mellon and with my colleague uh, there, uh, Scott Mattis, and we are really looking to energy sensors. Uh, and basically, the idea is that we have one sensor in the house that you clip in the main feed in the house, and you start looking at those peaks that it's energy consumption and uh, being able to classify those peaks and trying to understand what we are seeing and trying to create an energy bill that looks like a supermarket bill. I spend a hundred dollars in energy, ten dollars in air conditioning, five dollars in my refrigerator, three dollars watching TV, being able to make better decisions and how you replace things in our house, how you use, how you behave within the house to save more energy. In this case you're seeing those those uh, small peaks. This is the coffee machine that Carnegie Mellon uh, the, in the civil engineering department and you can see when people are getting tea, when people are getting coffee, when they're getting mocha, uh, mocha it's a complete different behavior of energy consumption for each of those operations. So the idea is to have a one chip sensor, in this case two, if you have two faces and clip in both faces and then being able to recognize all the appliances and keep a track of all the uses. So, uh, uh, there are different ways that you are looking. So the idea is to go from uh, sensors uh, uh, and uh, create a real-time analysis of how you are using energy in the house. So basically, this is what I had. So Nicole, if you have questions, please uh, forward them that you have a little bit less than 10 minutes. Thank you, Lucio. Uh, yes, we do have a question. Um, he um, it's actually from I think one of your former students, um, and he's wondering if the geospatial data warehouse has been adopted by the government and whether it is open to analysis from the public. Huh. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's a real thing. When we started, it was uh, we didn't. Uh, I don't think that us neither the government realized that this was such dangerous. Okay, we, uh, we, when we were able, we were just looking, okay, if you have a hurricane, who's affected? But you can reverse engineer with it and de de do what I, I described it before, uh, uh, rank uh, uh, infrastructure by criticality. So basically, uh, this would create a problem with, uh, would help a terrorist to find out what's the best bridge to explode in the United States. Okay, so... Uh, uh, they got uh, very concerned, so all our publications that I did with Jim and Scott and with Chung Young had to go to government clearance before being published. We had to, uh, un uh, to just change the data from the real data to a more artificial data to present the concept, but not to present the real data. And, uh, and uh, yes, it's being used. Uh, the student Chung Young now works for a consulting company uh, that is working with the government. Uh, uh, they are going beyond coal. Uh, they are working now for gas distribution too. So the coal is already implemented. Okay, thank you. Um, what do you see on the horizon? I mean, what 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 sort of new new technologies in this area do you think we'll see in the next? Um, next few years that will be able to be applied to industry? Uh, several, okay. So uh, you see these, the electricity, the last one I didn't, <coughs> I didn't uh, uh, have time to go in detail. I try, unfortunately, try to show as always too, ma too many things and uh, without going in depth. But, uh, but uh, these, for example, there is a patent and this is being uh, 
uh, use it in uh, tested in several houses today. Uh, Bosch, that is, was the original funding agency organization. Bosch uh, uh, Electronics uh, funded, and then we got an NSF grant to continue. <coughs> it's looking into commercialization. So w w those things are going to be deployed uh, into <coughs> houses. Uh, what they are looking for is uh, first uh, to help you to interact with systems like we tell your house how much you want to spend in energy. You want to say in the beginning of the month, I want to spend $100 by the end of the month in electricity. And your house would tell you, OK, if you keep this behavior, by the end of the month, your bill is going to be 130 But if you change your thermostat from, a, uh, from 69 to 71 degrees, it's going to be a little bit warmer, but you're going to achieve your goal. Uh, they are looking to, to diagnostic systems and appliances. So looking, for example, when you have a signature for your refrigerator, it evolves if you have a compressor problem. So the, they would be able to get from the signature automatically knowing when you should be replacing or fixing your refrigerator. So a lot of things are uh, uh, sensing. It's, it's a lot of good research going on today for several, several different universities, people using all the sensor research uh, there is no way to deal with sensor if you don't deal with those tools. Uh, sensors are, you think many sensors at 60 hertz, 60 measurements per second, so uh, you really have to be able to clean, to deal, to, to uh, uh, organize this data and to crunch this data and to make some sense from the data. So every work in Georgia Tech from Johan in, 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 uh, in safety has to use those, uh, those tools. Uh, Yonis is developing a lot of, uh, of work in Georgia Tech too for, for uh, uh, recognition of, uh, of uh, a measurement, automatic measurement for, for, uh, for uh, uh, creating 3D models for, from, uh, from, uh, from cameras, not having to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on laser scanners. Uh, uh, we have still Jim Garrett and, and, and Burchua King doing fantastic work. And so there are so many research, and I don't have a doubt that a lot of those things are going to, to move very, very fast to construction sites. I think that the, the, the one that it's very near is dealing with radio frequency tags. Uh, tracking and, and, and uh, management data from workers, from, uh, from uh, uh, materials, from uh, equipment, all these uh, in real time, uh, uh, a lot of GPS, I added to uh, local indoor positioning systems, uh, oh, so many things. Uh, uh, Burchu, it's doing a, ver a lot of interesting work with, uh, with hospitals and helping them to do their asset management and uh, maintenance and operations of hospitals, uh, uh, optimizing the uh, AC systems, uh, 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 so the mechanical systems, a lot to be done with more information about the way that they operate. Okay, thanks. Um, we have quite a few questions, so we'll see what we can get through here. Um, in the case of special analysis for water, are you using any commercial third-party software or developing it by yourself? How about Windows Visio? Uh, <clears throat> no, for, for the water, we use the basically GIS tools, okay? And uh, you, uh, we created all the, the clustering. Basically, it was a clustering tool uh, for for uh, for for uh, for uh, clustering the data, but uh, it's a simple GIS, and then you wrote uh, Daniel wrote the whole code on top of that in Java. Uh, uh, Visio, yeah, Visio. For example, if you see the examples from Carlos and Yonis in the, the integration of text documents and the integration of images, it uses uh, Visio to open uh, the IFC files. But again, the code was all written on top of it. We tend to write our own code. OK. Um, this question comes from Loughborough University. What is the future of knowledge discovery? It appears Carlos did his own coding. Now there is software, but we have found it still needs a lot of upfront data processing. This is a big obstacle for companies to take knowledge discovery seriously despite the potential benefits. Do you see this becoming a system of submitting a standard MS Word document and software finding trends matched with already stored documents? I know who asked this question. 
you gave you out. Okay. I'm so trying. I'm trying to keep it anonymous. <laughs> yeah, that's impossible. Uh, uh, no, uh, that's a good question. Uh, but this is not a problem in construction. Okay, this is a problem in the whole data mining. Uh, any book in data mining. Uh, says that 80% uh, uh, of the, off, uh, the, the, the process is in data cleaning and data pre-processing. Every time that you see a flow chart with the data mining process, knowledge discovery process, you have uh, data preparation, data cleaning, feature selection taking more than 80% of your time and really the crunching of the data uh, being a much, much smaller uh, uh, amount of time. Uh, uh, and, and this is a problem uh, uh, that I think that it's a very, very rich uh, uh, area for research and I know that the person that asked this question is very interested in doing good contribution in this area. Um, what are your thoughts on application of large volumes of photos and videos that are currently available on job sites to automate construction performance assessment processes? Uh, can you repeat it? Uh, no. Um, what are your thoughts on the application of large volumes of photos and videos that are currently available on job sites to automate construction performance assessment processes? I think that that's a no-brainer. That has to be done. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, for example, automatic productivity measurement from images. Uh, why you go and measure if you can get a camera measuring for us? Okay. So this, as I said, it, Leon is doing a lot of work on this now in Georgia Tech. Uh, 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 it's obvious this is data, and you have to use the uh, people are. Uh, this data is being acquired. Um, for me, almost without purpose. Okay? Uh, yeah, it's a website with a live camera for people to see in which stage the, the project is, uh, 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 safety cameras and all those types of things, but uh, uh, obviously that if you are uh, with a camera in front of an operation and a bricklayer is building a wall, it's obvious that this should be used and it could be measuring automatic productivity and so those tools have to be go from the academic world to the practical world and I don't think that they are very far from this. I think that very, very soon people will be able to deploy those things on, on. Even if it's not perfect measurement, if you, depending the angle, the issues with cameras, compared to laser scanner that you have much higher accuracy, but you can get orders of magnitude, you can get some measurements, I don't see why you are not using it. Okay, thanks, Lucio. And last and final question: um, Are there? Do you have any references that you can recommend for further knowledge and information on these topics? Like, on, is there a website or blogs or um, probably yeah, your many has. websites, many blogs? Uh, uh, I always recommend a starting book for people with interest in data mining. Uh, it's the uh, data mining knowledge discovery book from G. V. Hunt. Okay. Uh, uh, for me, this is the. Uh, he's a professor in Illinois in computer science. Uh, he, ha he has a co-author that I cannot remember the name now, but uh, uh, he is. A, a, this is a very good book to start, and explain uh, what are the tasks that you can do with data mining. What's the difference from classification to clustering? To, uh, to dealing with text, to dealing with images. He has one chapter in any of those things. Yeah, they are not in depth, but they have good references from there. That's a very good starting point. So his name is G. V. Hunt. If you have, if anyone wants the, the whole reference, just send me a, a email. Or I can, uh, I can uh, uh, provide this this book. Uh, and uh, there are several papers that I published. To it's all these that I presented. We have papers published in different journals and uh, uh, and uh, I think that I can give a, li a long list for each of those areas of references. So my mail it's Soibelman, it's my last name, at usc.edu. Wonderful. Um, I saw I had a few people wanting a repeat on that author. G. V. Han, right? H-U-N? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Uh, H-A-N. H-A-N. All right, well, we have um, just passed the hour, so we're going to close for today. I want to thank you again, um, Lucio, for taking the hour and sharing your research with all of us, and congratulations on your Outstanding Researcher Award. 
Um, and for all of you who joined us, thank you. We will be making a copy of this presentation, both the audio and the slides, available on the fiatech.org website uh, in the next day or two. So please check um, in the webinar section for uh, a posting in the next day or two. Thanks again, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.